Welcome to this edition of Viewpoint on Mormonism. I'm your host, Bill McKeever, founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry. And with me today is Aaron Shafawalaf, my colleague at MRM. Good to have you with me. Thank you. And today we want to discuss an event that you were a participant in, and that was a debate with a Latter-day Saint. It was held on March 6th at Utah Valley University, and uh, there was quite a bit of people. They had to put out a lot more chairs. Maybe than what 300. They had yeah, I, I would say there was a good turnout. You were debating Kwaku L, and Kwaku is spelled K-W-A-K-U. His last name is E-L. He's kind of unique, wouldn't you say, in the whole grand picture of Mormonism. He's a, a young man. Uh, he's He's pretty articulate. He knows how to handle himself. But tell me why you felt that this would have been a positive thing to do. So we've done a prior debate, and that was more moderately toned, if you will. And some time has passed, and Kwaku has uh, continued to oppose the gospel, oppose the biblical gospel of grace. And he is a YouTube influencer. So I, I would argue that he has more front and center influence on BYU students, for example, or those his age in his community, than the Mormon apologists that you and I might think of and, and interact with uh, in terms of literature. He is a social influencer. He is also a part of projects where he is paid by Mormon apologetics groups to do YouTube videos and so I've seen people, even in my own church, ex-Mormon Christians, who used to look up to him, who used to be influenced by him, uh, follow his videos. And so it would be, just at a pastoral level, a matter of encouragement to have someone take him on. And another thing that kind of just tipped the scales for me in terms of the tone that I decided, or the aggression that I decided to use uh, in this debate, was uh, two things. One is he came down to Manti, and he went to the streets where all these wonderful Christians who, out of evangelical fervor and sweet, motivating grace uh, to evangelize Mormons, he, he went down there and he uh, was a part of a small group of guys that held up very condescending, mocking, contemptuous signs, like this was all a big joke. And it looked like he was going down there for a kind of YouTube stunt, and he produced a video out of that that was just really uh, snide and mocking toward Christians, contemptuous. I I mean, it's pretty nasty toward Christians. So basically what he's doing is everything that we as individuals and MRM as a ministry try to encourage Christians not to do from our side of the fence, trying to address the Latter-day Saint. Yeah, we're trying to promote the gospel. And we're trying not to mock the people, and we are trying to have constructive conversations that are substantive, and we're not doing this for a show, um, and we're not doing this to ridicule the common Mormon person. So the other thing was that he posted a video on YouTube mocking the Christian motto, is Jesus enough? And he mocked the evangelical doctrine of grace, arguing that it basically enables people to go out and be unrepentant sinners without any consequence. So I thought, you know, if if he's willing to go after this motto, is Jesus enough, why don't we turn that into a debate? And why don't we figure out some subtopics? And why don't we make them applicable to the the motto? And And I told him up front, going into the debate, I am going to be more aggressive in this debate. I'm going to, I'm going to punch hard. Um, I'm not going to be sweet or nice in this debate. And I wanted him to know that beforehand because I did not want him to to be surprised by that. I was functioning, in my own mind, as a believer who was fighting in the corner, as it were, of evangelical Christians back against uh, his contempt for the gospel, his public mockery of the gospel, and his condescension toward evangelical Christian believers And so I prayed that I would not be nice. I prayed that I would be bold and unapologetic 
in the sense of being confident and f- straightforward. I still wanted to maintain a professional sense of courtesy and respect in the interaction, but I wanted to be uh, hard hitting. And I think you accomplished that. I was there. And I remember you telling me because we had to speak together at a church north of Salt Lake City. And as we were driving up there, you were explaining to me what you, your game plan was, your strategy for the debate. And we had a, a real good discussion on this. I can understand what you were trying to accomplish, and I fully agree with it. And I wouldn't say that you misbehaved at all. I mean, you're, you're a passionate guy to begin with. And I think sometimes people might misunderstand your passion. Once they get to know you, certainly it makes complete sense. But I didn't think that you were mean at all. I thought that you were bold. I thought you were firm. And sometimes I think that word is lost when it comes to why we do what we do. We want to be firm, but compassion is at the same time. But now in a debate format, that's a little bit different. It's been a long time since I was in a formal debate, and I've explained to you why I'm not, I shy away from a lot of those, because many times you're talking with people in the LDS church who have no authority whatsoever. And I noticed this as the debate went on with Kwaku. He was making some comments that no Latter-day Saint would feel obligated to agree with him on those positions, because let's be quite honest, folks, in the grand scheme of things of Mormonism— He's a nobody. He has no authority to speak for the church. And so it's merely just his opinion, which is always I found to be the problem when you're discussing matters in a formal setting like that. I do appreciate the fact that he seems on the whole, with exceptions here, to try to represent traditional mainstream Mormonism. So he doesn't seem to be like a Robert Millet or Stephen Robinson or Blake Osler who live on the very edges of Mormonism, of its theology. And so he doesn't seem to try on some core issues to hedge. He tries instead to use his wit Mm -hmm. and his uh, charisma to double down on uh, some of the core theology uh, of Mormonism. Um, But there are huge exceptions to that. Well, let me ask you a question, Aaron, because you you explained that one of the reasons why you wanted to engage Kwaku in this debate was because of his apparent dislike or contempt for the, the idea, is Jesus enough? But yet, in the debate, there were times when he seemed to try and argue for that very premise. So he, he in the video, for example, on YouTube, in the original video, he ends up affirming that he thinks there's a sense in which he can say Jesus is enough. He just doesn't like what we mean by it. Um, and he thinks it's a it's a it's a thin motto that we're abusing. Uh, so he'll he'll try to own it in the end, um, but what, he'll he'll pervert it. What he says in the debate is Jesus is enough to save us from those ugly Protestant beliefs. Mm. That's the way he construed it. Yeah, he he started off with a lot of ad hominem. In fact, I I was noticing from the first ten seconds. Yes, from the first ten seconds. And it was amazing, uh, all the logical fallacies that I was noticing him using in order to try and make his point. And that's why I ask you about this phrase, is Jesus enough? Because it almost sounds like there was a lot of equivocation going on. One minute that phrase is okay, the next minute it doesn't seem like it was okay. And it probably was confusing to some that were listening. And naturally in a debate, it's very easy when you have things going back and forth in a rapid fire moment, I should say, to maybe miss some of the things. And I was trying very hard to catch everything that was being said so it all made complete sense. There is so much to that debate. I think it'll require hours of debriefing if people really want to benefit from the content. There are reasons why I asked what I asked, but I I don't think that the common person would understand why I used the wording that I did because it's so particular to the context of communicating the gospel to Mormons. Now, when we say, is Jesus enough, or when we say Jesus is enough, explain before we go off air today what that means to us. In the debate, I took the position that Jesus is our proxy. We receive him by empty-handed faith, and he accomplishes, he has accomplished, celestial law on our behalf, and he's given us a backstage pass into the celestial kingdom to be with Christ, seated with Christ forever. 
that Jesus is enough to establish a kingdom that will not be shaken, uh, that will not be uprooted, a church that will not be prevailed against. Uh, there's no second growing season required, as it were. He is the final head of the, if you want to call it a dispensation. He's the, the one who, who rooted the kingdom in a final definitive way. And then lastly, our satisfaction in Christ is enough such that we're not worried about being married in the afterlife. Uh, we, we know that our being with Christ, knowing Christ, being alongside his people, knowing Christ is more than enough. We don't need to carry over all the earthly marital institutions to have a happy and joyful, full, eternal life. Yeah, I think we should explain some things to some of our listeners. For You used a phrase, celestial law. Now, in Mormonism, each level of kingdom, the celestial, terrestrial, and telestial kingdom, has its own set of laws, and whatever law an individual lives during this mortality, this mortal probation, as they call it, will determine where they end up in the next life. Now, when you use the word celestial kingdom, we're not talking about a place like in Mormonism, where we get our own world, it's an analogy. And we become gods, and we start to procreate through out eternity, and the, our offspring will then worship us as God of this world, as we worship or are supposed to worship, as Mormons are supposed to worship Elohim as their God, who is over all this world. So, definitely, there are some differences in the terminology. That's always important if you're going to fully understand where a Latter Day Saint is coming from, and I hope that. The Mormons that were there, and I, I would imagine they probably did understand clearly your position because you came out of the gate making it very obvious that there was a strong disagreement between what we believe as New Testament Christians and what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes. Now, this is online. Yes, this is online. If you just search on YouTube for Kweku and Aaron debate, you'll find it. Okay, now there were two, though. You did another one earlier. Yes, so this one will be published in 2020. Okay, so look for the 2020 debate between Kwaku and Aaron Shafawalaf. And in tomorrow's show, we're going to talk some more about what took place in this debate that was held on March 6, 2020 at Utah Valley University. So glad you could be with us for this edition of Viewpoint on Mormonism. I'm your host, Bill McKeever, founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry. And with me today is my colleague, Aaron Shafawalaf. If you were listening to yesterday's show, we were discussing a debate that Aaron recently had with a Latter-day Saint young man by the name of Kwaku L. It was held at the Utah Valley University on March 6, 2020, and so we felt this would be a good time to discuss, first of all, as we did yesterday, why you did this in the first place, and some of the issues that you felt were important in bringing up. And you mentioned yesterday, Aaron, that you had seen Kwaku in action when we were down in Manti, Utah, during the last of the Mormon miracle pageants. You were very disturbed by his behavior and his apparent contempt for what Christians believed. I was there. I saw some of the signs that uh, some of his friends were yeah. carrying down there. I never engaged with him, though I did have a short engagement with one of his buddies down there. And uh, I would agree, there seems to be a, a lot of contempt for what we believe on their part, which I, I find fascinating because it tends to show a side of Mormonism that many Latter-day Saints don't want exposed yeah. because many times they want to appear or, we're Christians just like you. We might have some slight disagreements, but Kwaku does not hold to that position. One of the requests I made of those helping me with the video on the debate is to show his face more during the debate, just mm. so people can see how he reacts to what I teach. Um, and if I could be frank here, the smug, dripping arrogance that mm -hmm. continued throughout the entire debate, I want people to see that. Um, I want it to be exposed. Uh, this is one of their front people right now for promoting their theology to younger Mormons. And what's interesting about that is arrogance, pride, things like that are certainly condemned in the Book of Mormon, in Alma 5, it basically says that if you're not stripped of pride, you're not even prepared right. to die, according to Mormonism. That always strikes me as the great irony of this faith. You have Latter-day Saints defending the book that condemns every single Latter-day Saint, because it's hard to find, in my opinion, and at least in my experience, a truly humble 
Latter-day Saint. And I think it's because Mormonism tends to stir up the pride that's within us. Yeah, it puts a very sweet voice, a sweet set of mannerisms over the, I'm going to become a god someday. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a good and righteous and worthy person. Yeah, I've often used the expression, it's kind of hard to be humble when you think you're going to be a god down the road. Let's talk about what you brought up. When you were given the platform, you started off with what, well, I'll call it the David analogy. Explain what you brought up and why you use that strategy. So for Christians, discussing grace with Latter-day Saints is tough because there's a lot of definitional groundwork. There's a lot of equivocation. There's a lot of wide semantic range of what a, one particular word might mean. And then there's a lot of operating categories. There's just, there's a ton of work you have to do to communicate clearly grace. So um, I tried to do two things. One is I tried to clearly define the salvation benefits I have right now in Christ. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm guaranteed of my inheritance. Um, I have the gift of the Holy Ghost. I've already, according to Paul in Ephesians 2, been raised with Christ and seated with him. John 5, 24, I already have eternal life right now. So I'm not talking about the mere minimalistic notion of being resurrected. Um, I'm not talking about being stuck in a lower kingdom, a, a lower heavenly kingdom that Mormonism says is a heavenly kingdom, but it, it'll be like an eternal punishment and a hell. So I thought in the cross-examination, how about I focus on the person of David, of King David? And the reason is, oh, and there's so many good reasons. He needed forgiveness. He needed salvation. This David, if we could start out negatively here, he was a scumbag. He abused his power, committed adultery uh, with Bathsheba, and he brought Uriah to his death and uh, actually caused the death of a few more, too, in that incident. And this was horrific. If this happened in 2020, such a man rightly would not survive the Me Too movement. He would be uh, obliterated, as he ought to be. Yes. And so here we have David, who deserves to be canceled. He deserves to be publicly shamed for this. And David, though, by God's providence, he ends up writing the key psalms on repentance and forgiveness. Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, where he cries out for forgiveness in Psalm 51 for his blood guiltiness. We also have in perhaps the starkest passage on grace in the New Testament, Romans chapter 4, verse 5, where Paul says that God justifies the ungodly when they stop working for it and their faith is counted for righteousness. The next verse says, quote, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then what Paul does is he quotes from Psalm 32, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. And he repeats that in three different ways. So David is upheld as a New Testament role model of celebrated justifying grace and forgiveness. And we still hear of David as a man after God's own heart. He's still celebrated as a king. He is told in the Old Testament by Nathan, who confronts him, that, quote, your sin has been put away. That is incredible. This mm -hmm. is a sin for which David deserves to die. But Nathan tells him, your sin has been put away. Now, this is an incredible convergence of different things here that are worth bringing out. One, in the Joseph Smith translation, Nathan says to David, your sin hath not been put away. And I think Smith here is operating with this murder can't be forgiven assumption. So he's trying to smooth over the text here. And in the Romans 4 passage I just quoted, Joseph Smith changes it to say, God justifieth not the ungodly. Now let's talk about that for a minute, because if that is true, there is not a human being on earth that could have any hope of salvation or forgiveness. And I think that's important. When he puts that word not in there, come on, folks, we understand. When you put the word not in a sentence, you've completely changed the meaning of the sentence. And Smith does do that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's devastating. And I asked Kwaku in the debate about whether God justifies the ungodly, and he said no. And so I asked him, well, what's the point of Romans 1 through 3, that we're godly or that we're ungodly? And he mockingly said, well, Christ imputeth us his righteousness. 
I don't even think he believes that. He's just speaking facetiously. And I said, well, well, who in Romans is receiving this righteousness, the godly or the ungodly? And he said, well, the godly, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't think he understood that Romans 1 through 3 sets up as its whole argument the deep, wicked, sinful, carnal state of man and our need for the free justification, for the, the gift of righteousness. So this ends up being an, an amazing convergence of little touch points of Mormonism. In DNC 132, Joseph Smith writes that David has, quote, fallen from his exaltation. And Joseph Smith teaches elsewhere in the DNC that murder, uh, murders cannot be forgiven. It's not a forgivable sin. So you have a lot of Latter-day Saint attempts at using grace language. And yet when you get down to the particulars of David, he, according to LDS theology, has been permanently disqualified, permanently disqualified from ever entering the presence of God, i.e. the celestial kingdom, ever truly having the fullness of eternal life. And this is incredible, especially in light of the Psalms, where David says things like, cast me not away from your presence, or deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, or surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is incredible. Uh, My first evangelistic conversation that I remember ever having in Utah, the first one I ever had on the street, I remember having read books to prepare for these conversations, but it was Psalm 51 that was on my heart. I had on the bus uh, to Temple Square been meditating on Psalm 51, internalizing it, David's prayer of forgiveness, into my own heart for my own sins, my own forgiveness. And when I got to the street to talk to my first Latter-day Saint, all I could do was open up to Psalm 51 and read it and ask this gentleman, about it. And I asked this gentleman, did David get what he asked for? And the essential answer was no. And I remember being flabbergasted by mm-hmm. this. Uh, so I asked Kwaku about this, and there was a ton of equivocation on this. I asked him about Latter-day Saint leaders who have taught that David is still paying for his sin right now. And Kwaku insisted that, well, he would still be forgiven, but what we had to kind of pick out was he's not forgiven in the fullest sense of having celestial exaltation made available to him. I wanted to help use this as an illustration that Mormons, at least the Mormons that agree with Mormonism, don't really believe that the blood of Jesus was sufficient to cover the terrible sins of of David, nor do they think a broken-hearted, empty-handed faith is sufficient to receive the incredible gift of God's righteousness and his eternal life and forgiveness. If they did, they would have to rework the theology of David. But David doesn't pass muster in the merit system of Mormonism. It's it's tragic. So I I was pretty aggressive in that critical examination period with Kwaku, uh, largely because he was equivocating and he was hedging and so uh, I, I pushed really hard on that, and I hope people uh, benefit from it. I think they will if they are to listen to the debate very carefully, as we've been discussing. They can readily see that this is an individual who claims to be honoring his belief system. And yet what he's saying doesn't come across as the way a lot of our Mormon neighbors might come across. And this is what I think can be very deceptive and that you have a lot of your Mormon neighbors maybe are trying to make it sound like their belief system is not all that different. But when you have a guy like Kwaku, and and in this kind of a situation, based on why you had the debate in the first place, it becomes readily apparent that he certainly does not believe in the all-sufficiency of Christ. And I don't think Mormons understand why that strikes us as so problematic. I mean, what are you possibly going to do to make up for that? If you have a sin problem, if you're a fallen person, your works are only as good as you are. So what are you going to give? What are you possibly going to give? It's like a cat bringing a dead mouse to the front doorstep. 
good analogy. <laughs> here, are, here are my works. A filthy, dirty, lice, <laughs> flea-bitten... Coronavirus-ridden. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> mouse. Put it in the proper context here. Tomorrow, we're going to continue talking about the debate that Aaron had with Kwaku L. We want to look at some more of the things that were brought up in that discussion. Our thanks to Adams Road Band for that musical introduction. Welcome to this edition of Viewpoint on Mormonism. I'm your host, Bill McKeever, founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry. And with me today is Aaron Shafawalaf, my colleague at MRM. Welcome back, Aaron. I'm really enjoying this discussion that we're having regarding the debate that you had with a Latter-day Saint man by the name of Kwaku L. It was held on March 6, 2020 at the Utah Valley University. There was easily about 300 people there. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were putting more chairs out. And I think it's a pertinent topic. It's something that interests a lot of people. I was reading some of the comments on Facebook after the debate was over. You received a a lot of kudos, especially from some former Mormons who I think really needed to hear what you had to say. And even from some active Mormons. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, and, and that's great. And so, but let's again go back. What, were the topics of the debate? The three topics were, is salvation by faith alone? And beforehand, I was very clear with Kwaku that by salvation here, I'm taking the position that this is receiving eternal life, adoption, sealing of the Holy Spirit, guaranteeing our inheritance. Secondly, was there a great apostasy? Thirdly, are families forever, which has as its focus uh, in the definition of family there, the nuclear family. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier show, you and I had a speaking engagement north of Salt Lake City where we were to be there for a Q&A session, and you were discussing some of the things that you plan to bring up during this debate. So I was pretty familiar with your game plan, mm-hmm. your strategy. I've got to tell you, Aaron, one of the things that really bothered me was almost immediately... Kwaku launches off into a lot of logical fallacies, which I found to be very troubling, but he also went off topic. So I don't think people realize just how ugly this was. To set it up, we had a sponsor for the debate, which was paying a, at their own cost, a substantial sum to help rent the facility. We had teams of evangelical Christians helping advertise the debate. And we had a lot of people just helping spread the word and show up under the assumption that we were going to debate the actual topics as advertised. Now, when Kwaku and I decided on the topics, we had to get a moderator. So we were looking for a moderator, and I thought, you know, let's just use the sponsor of of the event to help moderate. His name is also Aaron. And I thought, you know, we're not going to need a strong moderator. And we, we talked about it, and the idea was, you know, we can trust each other to play by the ground rules of the debate. That's part of what makes a debate a debate is you have a structure, a set of topics, and you stay relatively within your lane and you have a focused conversation on those topics. So you had about 300 people there uh, waiting in this auditorium and Kwaku shows up 30 minutes late while 300 people are waiting. And he gets up for his portion of the debate, and he almost immediately goes way off the topic. Instead of talking about is salvation by faith alone, which has a pretty standard set, a a domain of of, uh, points of interest and texts that are treated, he almost immediately starts talking about predestination and Calvinism, and basically spent much of his time in topic one and topic two talking about Luther and Calvin and arguing about how he thought they were so awful and how Christians essentially were a hop, skip, and a jump away from being, uh, it just sounds silly saying this out loud, but he argued that we were a hop, skip, and a jump from basically being uh, supporting mass murder. And the... Uh, he brought that up throughout the debate, it should be mentioned, throwing it out there as a little dig here and there. That Protestantism has a roundabout contribution to the Holocaust and to American slavery, that, it's the, that his idea was not that just cultural Protestantism can be linked to it, but that the theology of believing that the Bible is sufficient and what we believe what the Bible says is itself gives way to mass murder. This is not about salvation by faith alone, what he's talking about here. This isn't about justification or adoption 
or sanctification. This, this isn't about the texts that we're, we're dealing with. Um, this ended up just being a smear, a bunch of historical overstatements even, but it very ugly. Uh, I'm gonna, I, don't, I try not to use this word loosely, but I'll use it. A hateful display of contempt for Protestant Christians. And with a smile on his face, all the while mocking me for having evangelical fervor and higher volume and assertive preaching, but a kind of sweet, soft hate in his voice for Protestant Christians. At a debate where he showed up 30 minutes late with people that had spent time and money helping advertise the debate, Kwaku came under false pretenses, and he violated the social contract of a debate to stay relatively within the lane of the agreed-upon topics, and he showed himself to be an untrustworthy debate partner So I tried to roll with it. I think probably one of the best criticisms I received was that I took the bait and I went down rabbit holes. And I think if I had to do it over again, I would have addressed it head on to show that I'm not hedging on the issues. I want to be bold and unapologetic and affirm what the Bible says about these topics. But I ought not have gone so far deep down the hole. And what's strange about this is the last debate we did, we had a whole subtopic on Uh, predestination. And so it's not that we're afraid to talk about it. It's not that I would shy away from having even a debate about it or talking about it. It's that that wasn't this debate. And he violated the the trust and the social contract inherent to the debate. He most certainly did. And And I think he only enforced an idea that I've had for a long time when talking with Mormons one on one, because I've had them bring that up. They'll say, well, what about Calvinism? Here's my answer. Now, I know you probably need to address at least some points in a debate context, but the reason why I usually don't, and the common line that I've used with Latter-day Saints is, look, the Calvin-Arminian debate is an in-house debate, and you're not in the house. And it's clear, by the way, Kwaku was describing it as if that is evangelical Christianity only prove my point. They're not ready for that discussion. And so usually on the streets, typically a lay person in the church is not ready for that discussion either. They just have stereotypes of what they think it is. And rather than waste a lot of time on that, I would much rather get to where they are in light of eternity. The way he presents it is also deceptive because he's not attacking Calvinism for Calvinism. He's attacking Calvinism for being an expression of classic theism. And here's what I mean by that. When I've discussed this issue with Kwaku in the past, it's become clear that any theistic model which has God as the ultimate primary cause, and God as the foundation of all being, and God as the one who knows the definite future, any classical theistic model where God uh, has that certain future, or he knows what will come to pass, and he decides to go with it anyway. That would include the Arminian position, the Calvinistic position, the Molinist position. That all violates the sensibilities that he has for what would constitute a just and fair God. So what I brought up in the debate later was, look, his complaints against this are not particular to Calvinism. He has elsewhere expressed favor for the view of what's called open theism. Open theism is the view that God does not know the definite future that he knows the possible outcomes, but he does not know the definite outcomes with respect to human decision-making. For a lot of Mormon philosophers and those who dabble in Mormon philosophy, that is the only choice they see as viable for rescuing themselves, as it were, or rescuing God, if they could, from the problem of evil. So Kwaku, while he might look like he's taking a snipe at Calvinism, he's actually, with respect to his actual complaints, He's firing a shotgun against all of classical theism. And I would even include classic Mormon theism because classic Mormonism affirms God's foreknowledge. At some point, a lot of Latter-day Saint leaders have talked very frankly about God knowing the definite future. They know what we will do. They've had a view of simple foreknowledge. So he ends up throwing his own leaders under the bus by uh, favoring open theism. Let's talk about that expression under the bus, because you used that expression in the debate when he kept using examples from Luther in his later life, specifically some of his comments regarding the Jews, 
And he also brought up Calvin and the issue with Servetus. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if a lot of people understood the history behind both those events and both of those issues, but you made the comment that you would have no problem throwing a Luther or a Calvin under the proverbial bus for those expressions and deeds that were troubling and certainly antithetical to our Christian view. If needed, I will throw all of Calvin and all of Luther under the bus wherever they contradict the Bible or Christian ethics. So I'm not beholden to them like I am my prophets and apostles. And what I told them was I would not want to be a part of a religion that has to throw its apostles and prophets under the bus. Um, I'm not ashamed of Paul. In the debate, Kwaku actually went after Paul. He basically called Paul, uh, in a roundabout way, he called him a sexist. He said that Paul held sexist views. And later, uh, another Mormon apologist in the Q&A got up and said that Paul essentially was a racist. And Kwaku seemed to be favorable toward that, too. So he threw Paul under the bus. And what I ended up telling Kwaku in the debate was, I'm happy to treat Calvin and Luther like you treat, uh, like you treat Brigham Young. You throw Brigham Young under the bus so fast when you don't agree with him. Well, you know what? That's how I treat Martin Luther and Calvin whenever they don't align with the Bible. I'm happy to quote them where they're great. I'm happy to disagree with them where they're not great. But if you have a prophet or an apostle, you have to treat them with a higher standard of accountability. And they don't. They seem to just, oh, well... They don't take them that seriously. That's what is very frustrating sometimes when having this discussion with Latter-day Saints. They want to revere these men as being chosen by God to guide the church. And they do give this air of infallibility, though they would never go that far and say it like that. But like even what we're hearing right now and, and a lot of Mormons praising how they have Russell M. Nelson, you know, they have the, the president of their church guiding them in this crisis that our country is going through. And really what he's saying is nothing any different that I could find on most websites when it comes to preparedness. Mostly repeating sake. the CDC recommendations. <laughs> Absolutely. It's, it's just very frustrating. But I, I agree with you totally. I think when it comes to bad behavior or even bad ideas that counter what we understand the New Testament to be teaching, we should be quick to refute those kind of statements and those kind of actions. But yet, unfortunately, he kept giving the impression that that was really the result of what we believe regarding this idea of salvation by grace and through faith and that Jesus was enough. We're going to continue this conversation with Aaron and the debate that he had with Kwaku L on March 6, 2020 at Utah Valley University. Welcome to this edition of Viewpoint on Mormonism. I'm your host, Bill McKeever, founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry. And with me today is Aaron Shafawalif, my colleague at MRM. This week, we've been discussing a debate, a formal debate, that Aaron had with a Latter-day Saint young man by the name of Kwaku L. There were three topics that were going to be discussed, and we've been going through some of those. And today, we want to go through the topic of the Great Apostasy, because the debate was divided into three parts. The Great Apostasy was one of those parts. So why did you choose that to be a subject? Well, Joseph Smith is upheld as the great head in Mormonism of the greatest and final dispensation. So he is the dispensation head of the, the ushering in of a permanent kingdom. But in the Bible, Jesus is. He's the one who plants the permanent, enduring, spreading kingdom. He's the one who ushers in a kingdom that will not be destroyed, that cannot be shaken. Uh, he is the one who builds a church, according to the New Testament, which cannot be prevailed against. So the New Testament Christian celebrates that Jesus has accomplished something as the mediator of a better new covenant that the old covenant did not, could not accomplish by its design even. So Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant. He ushers in a permanent kingdom. He plants a, an enduring kingdom and he builds a church that can't be prevailed against. And Christians adore the Lord Jesus Christ for this. Mormonism says that the church died. It was obliterated, that the kingdom of God was completely destroyed. Uh, it says that the kingdom needed to be uprooted and replanted. That's their language, not, right. not mine. Right. Uh, and it says that 
Well, it re- recasts all the New Testament passages to really give Joseph Smith the glory. And to top this all off, what, what I did in presenting all this is I talked about how arrogant of Joseph Smith this was. And I finished with a quote, a famous quote by Joseph Smith, where Smith, in trying to adopt Paul's language in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul is facetiously giving his apostolic credentials. Others had come to Corinth and touted their own apostolic credentials. And Paul's like, well, I've got credentials. Look at my back. (laughs) I've got all these stripes on my back. And so he boasts in all of his sufferings. Well, Joseph Smith takes this language. And in a sermon reported by his trusted clerk, Thomas Bullock, in a sermon, Joseph Smith says that he has suffered more than Paul and that he has done more and done a better job of keeping the church together than Jesus Christ. That that the apostles ran away from Jesus, but the followers of Joseph Smith have not run away from him yet. And this is arrogant. It's it's uh, immediately arrogant. I mean, it's just, it's recognizable as arrogant on the face of it. But it's especially arrogant when you consider that the New Testament gives Jesus the unique and exclusive glory for mediating a permanent covenant establishing a permanent kingdom building a church so yeah that was that was the what we got into but again Quaku used this opportunity to go against luther and calvin and so forth and uh, protestantism in a way that doesn't really respond to the actual content of the debate the debate the topic here is was there a great apostasy and so what you have to do is you have to define the great apostasy and you have to demonstrate that the definition has been satisfied by your, your arguments. There are two basic definitions given in Mormonism to the great apostasy. There's what I call the thick or the broad or robust definition where the kingdom of God is destroyed, the church is obliterated, the gospel has been removed from the earth, gospel principles, the pr- fundamental principles of the gospel are nowhere to be found, and people are without hope and without God in the world. And there's a black, moral, corrupt darkness. And that is the sort of the undercurrent of the people who claim to be Christians with this false authority. It's a very dark, it's cast in very dark terms and very bleak terms. The other definition of the great apostasy is what you might call the thin or the reductive, I don't know, uh, minimalist definition. And this is the definition that says, well, maybe the early first century Christians were well-meaning, moral, upstanding uh, loved Jesus, were doing all that they could, but that the quorum of the Twelve Apostles had a terrible logistics problem due to persecution, such that they could not gather as a quorum sufficient for the ordination of subsequent leadership. So it ends up, that thin definition ends up saying, well, they couldn't do then what UPS can do today. Right. That God had a logistics problem, even with well-meaning people. So What I started out with the cross-examination doing is setting up 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul gives of first importance the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his appearance to others. And then I read some thick, broad, robust definitions of the great apostasy from Mormon leaders, and I asked Kwaku about them. And he, I don't think he understood the significance of what I was asking him. I was essentially getting him to affirm the broad historic LDS definition of the great apostasy, and then asking him to reckon with that in light of 1 Corinthians 15. So if the fundamental principles of the gospel, according to Paul, are the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, was that lost from the earth? Were there no Christians with hope and with God in the world? Is it as Mormon leaders have said that there there were no Christians anywhere who had hope and who had God and who had the fundamental principles of the gospel. And he took that hook, line, and sinker, whereas in the Q&A in the debate, he decided to pull back and said, well, what the great apostasy is, it's just a loss of priesthood authority. And that's the thin definition. Yeah, anyway, Kwaku, though, he tried to show that Protestants were bad, that historically we have ugly, dark things in our history. For the record, I think he's really bad at history. I mean, he he thinks the Protestant Reformation starts with Luther. He didn't understand that the principles of what Calvin taught preceded Calvin. I don't think he really connected the dots here. He was arguing that Protestantism has brought death and destruction, 
But even if you grant that, just for the sake of argument, you still have to demonstrate that the whatever definition of the great apostasy you're choosing has been satisfied, has been has been met by history and scripture. You have to reckon with what scripture has said. So at the end of our interaction with the uh, cross-examination of great apostasy, I asked him about, so what were the passages that you brought up from the New Testament to support this? And I think he only brought up two. It, it, one was, I think, from Acts 20, where Paul, speaking to the Ephesian elders, says something bad is about to happen and, and these false teachers will not spare the flock. Yeah, the wolves would come in. Right. Yeah, they, the will church. Not, they will not spare the flock. And so what Mormon leaders construe that to mean is that the flock will be completely destroyed. So I just asked him, is Paul preparing the elders to endure through this season? Or is he telling them they're all going to die and they're not going to last through this season? And it's very clear. So what Kweku ended up doing is saying, well, maybe Paul didn't know about the great apostasy. Maybe he didn't even really understand what was about to happen, which is in a sense to withdraw the previous usage that he was uh, using with the, with the passage. And he also quotes from Matthew 24, where Jesus anticipates false prophets, persecutions. And I, I just, well, you know, that gives you apostasy. That gives you persecution. That gives you suffering. That doesn't give you the great apostasy as Mormonism defines it. So he never really made a case from his own worldview for the great apostasy. He never really actually made an argument. This is what's frustrating. He showed up like this was just a YouTube stunt to say some shock jock types of things. My wife and I were talking about this. She was like, Aaron, you just spent two days in our closet preparing for this debate. Literally, folks. Literally. literally. He was in the closet (laughs) studying where it was quiet. I got a picture of this. It's a big closet. But I I was, you know, kind of hiding away from all the noise and preparing. And I had spent roughly a month also just doing, you know, off and on preparation. But I had spent a lot of time putting together arguments and a structured presentation and reading a lot of Latter-day Saint literature to see what they typically present as an argument for the great apostasy. And he virtually, he, he interacted virtually with none of it. He just showed up like it was a game 30 minutes late and tried to make a historical smear against Protestantism and didn't quite understand the Protestant uh, commitment we have to scripture as our final authority. You can show me all sorts of bad things that Protestant Christians have done. And I'm so quick and able and free to throw any professing believer under the bus, as it were, and say, I don't agree with that. They they don't represent me. That's not my authority. That's not what I look to. Those aren't my prophets and apostles. Wherever they diverge from scripture, then I'm not on board with that. A lot of the verses that they do bring up, uh, my response to a lot of Latter-day Saints, at least when I'm talking to them either and talking to them either on the streets or in email, is you know, a lot of those very verses that they cite that they think speaks of a complete apostasy could very easily be turned around and pointed at the LDS church. And I've asked them, how do I know these verses aren't talking about you guys. Yeah, it's really interesting that Latter-day Saints say today that a great apostasy won't happen again. Right. And it's like, well, how do you know that? What, what, what are the assurances you have? It seemingly you want to enjoy the assurances of no longer having a future possible great apostasy again that were already given to the first century Christians. Uh, the passages that they do use to support the great apostasy, typically they never fulfill the actual definition of great apostasy. They often are speaking of a reality that culminates in the very second coming of Jesus, where it's not solved with a restoration, it's solved with a second coming. Mm. And they're often in a context where the readers are being encouraged to endure through the suffering and persecutions and the apostasy to happen in general uh, around them. That's a great point, and probably one that we should, as Christians, emphasize probably more than we do. The fact that they were encouraged to endure and to go on shows that there's something to go on for, that there would not be a complete apostasy as defined by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So that's that's a good point. We've been talking with Aaron Shafawalaf. He's a colleague at MRM, and he had a debate with Kwaku L on March 6, 2020 at Utah Valley University.
If you want to hear the debate in its entirety, and I would encourage you to do so, you may be frustrated listening to some of Kwaku's responses and some of the rabbit trails that he took during that time period, but I think it would be very valuable to hear Aaron's responses to the many things that Kwaku brought up. But you can find it very easily. Just Google search Aaron Kwaku Debate 2020, and it'll pop up. Tomorrow we're going to continue talking about what went on in this discussion that Aaron had with Kwaku L. Hoping you're having a very pleasant Friday. Welcome to this edition of Viewpoint on Mormonism. I'm your host, Bill McKeever, founder and director of Mormonism Research Ministry. And with me today is Aaron Shafawalaf, my colleague at MRM. This past week, we've been discussing a debate, a formal debate, that Aaron had with a Latter-day Saint man by the name of Kwaku L., This was on March 6, 2020, at the Utah Valley University. There were about 300 people that showed up for this. And uh, we were discussing some of the issues that were supposed to be debated. And as you've heard us explain this past week, sadly, Kwaku decided to go off the track and go into his own little tangents, trying to make Christianity look bad because of some of the things said or even done by professing Christians of the past. But Aaron, you brought up one portion from Doctrine and Covenants, section 86, which is a takeoff from Matthew chapter 13, starting with verse 24. Why don't you explain what that is and why you brought that up? So when I hear Christians address the great apostasy, I I usually hear the Matthew 16 passage, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, and a few other staple great texts. And the other the other argument I hear is that uh, the three Nephites, according to Mormonism, were still sticking around. They had priesthood authority. John still had priesthood mm-hmm. authority. Doctrine so and Covenants, section seven. That doesn't seem to satisfy the definition of great apostasy, where priesthood is taken from the earth. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a valid argument. But we have yet more scriptural evidence to look at. And we have some pretty powerful what's called kingdom growth parables in Matthew 13. Matthew 13 starts off with a parable the parable of the sower, where you've got different soils receiving seed and Jesus explaining the different responses that you're going to experience with people as the kingdom of God grows, you're going to see people fall away. And so Jesus is giving us an explanatory framework for a an enduring growth of the kingdom in the midst of fallings away, in the midst of bad reception. Jesus goes on to talk about another parable the parable of the wheat and tares. And in this parable, Jesus sets up one field and he talks about how the the son of man, he later interprets the parable, has planted this the good seed and then the evil one comes at night and he plants the bad seed. So the, the parameters of this pr- parable are different. There's one field, there's two sowers. And what's amazing about this parable is that Jesus goes on in the same chapter to interpret it. So if you're wondering what it means, you can just keep reading. And Jesus explains it himself. He explains that the wheat continues uh, and it persists until the harvest at the end of the age, the final judgment. And that is when the tares are, are to be uprooted. The idea was if you do this prematurely, then the wheat will also be uprooted. And so there's a, there's a coexistence that's tolerated between the wheat and the weeds until the harvest at the end of the age. Now, scholars recognize this as Jesus talking about the kingdom's enduring growth. And right after he gives the parable, Jesus gives two more. He gives one of the mustard seed, which starts small and grows large. And he talks about the three measures of the, the leaven. In those parables as well, you have a gradual, uninterrupted, unstoppable growth. And all three of the kingdom growth parables after the parable of the sower. And uh, what I tried to explain in the debate was that Joseph Smith saw these kingdom growth parables as a threat to the great apostasy narrative. So what he does in DNC 86 is he starts out by saying, I'm going to tell you what the parable of the wheat and tares meant. And he recasts it. So in order to make my point, what I did is I quoted from a BYU professor that you've spoken about on this program. His name's Charles Harrell. And he has a book called, This is My Doctrine, 
the development of Mormon theology. And what's significant about this book is it seems like, on the whole, to be the only serious overview treatment of the development of Mormon theology on a kind of wholesale, wide-scale uh, basis. Now, he is, I would, I would take him actually to be a closet agnostic. He's sort of a secular progressive. The way he treats truth at the end of the book, the way he, he's very cynical toward the Bible. So I, I don't agree with him. I think of him as a, a, as a secular progressive in, in a Mormon veneer. But the book is an incredible book when it comes to Mormon uh, history. And he recognizes this in his chapter on the Great Apostasy. So I quote Harrell as observing that Joseph Smith recasts this parable in DNC 86 to teach that the kingdom would be uprooted, that a second growing season was required, and that Joseph Smith construes the other two parables as being about the Book of Mormon and about the uh, three witnesses. So while Jesus sees these parables, even by his own explanation in the chapter, Jesus sees these these parables as kingdom growth parables concerning the unstoppable, perpetual, uninterrupted growth of the kingdom till the end of the age, uh, the harvest, the final judgment. Joseph Smith sees them as supporting the great apostasy, the uprooting, the obliteration of the church, the obliteration of the the wheat, um, the uprooting of it, the second growing season required, and how it's just a pretty straightforward contrast. So I would ask my evangelical brothers in Christ and sisters to consider this in Matthew 13. And uh, if you Google it, you'll see Joseph Smith's treatment of each of these parables. Uh, But it's pretty powerful. Uh, Jesus gets the glory in the New Testament for planting a kingdom that would not be uprooted. And Joseph Smith straightforwardly sees the writing on the wall here. He sees, "Uh uh-oh, this does not fit well with the restoration narrative needed where the kingdom the field, as it were, goes barren for 1,800 years and needs this rescuer, Joseph Smith, to help replant it. So correct me if I'm wrong. What you're basically saying here is that if a Latter-day Saint wants to believe Doctrine and Covenants, section 86, which is taken from Matthew 13, 24 and following, they have to deny the explanation that Jesus himself gave for those verses and the conclusion that Jesus gave for that parable in those verses. Yes, and Mormon scholars have a hard time dealing with this. So they end up arguing that, well, maybe Smith isn't actually interpreting the parable. Maybe he's just recasting it in in, in the sense that he's reusing the language. The problem, though, is that that's not how DNC 86 starts. It starts with a, you know, concerning the parable. It, it gives a very straightforward uh, reinterpretation of the parable. This is very straightforwardly a Jesus versus Joseph Smith scenario. So if you had Mormon missionary sitting in your front room and you turn to DNC 86 very quickly, how could you instruct a Christian to use that and which parts in particular would you point to? So I would want to read the Matthew 13 wheat and tares parable with Jesus' own explanation. And I would want to ask some reading comprehension questions like, does Jesus think that a second growing season would be required? And uh, what is the order of the uh, harvest, the order of the uh, uprooting at the very end? Why why is it that uh, an uprooting premature uh, is discouraged? So I'd want to ask him, you know, some basic reading comprehension questions. And then maybe supplement it with Matthew 16, where Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And then later he says, heaven and earth will pass away. My words will never pass away. And then at the very last paragraph of the same book, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus gives the great commission. And he sends out his disciples with his verbally given authority uh, to go evangelize the nations. And with a view to the evangelism of all the nations, he says, I will be with you to the end of the age. So there's just a great case to be made from the Gospel of Matthew. Anyway, I want to come back and focus on the parable of the wheat and tares, and then maybe go to DNC 86 and discuss how Smith teaches that 
the kingdom would not perpetually grow. It would be destroyed. It would be uprooted. That the basic details of the parable would be flipped and ask them uh, if they can make sense of that. You know, one of the great things about evangelism to Mormons is that even when we're dealing with hard soil, even when we're dealing with people who will never receive what we say, we, we don't know that, but even when that's the case, we get joy in glorying in Christ. We get to exalt in Christ. We get to have pleasure in the supremacy of Jesus Christ, his excellencies. And one of his excellencies here is him having brought a kingdom, planted a kingdom. Jesus says, if, if I cast demons out, then the kingdom of God has come among you. So Jesus brought a kingdom that we can celebrate as an enduring, perpetual, singularly planted kingdom that does not need a second growing season. And the reason why this is so crucial in our conversation with Latter-day Saints is because LDS leaders have made it clear that if there was not a complete apostasy of the Christian religion, that's the way B.H. Roberts of Mormon 70 said it, there would be no need for the Mormon church to exist. So if you can convincingly show a Latter-day Saint that Jesus himself said there is not going to be a complete apostasy, hopefully they're going to think that through and realize then there's a problem with the existence of their church because the very foundation of their church, this notion of a complete apostasy, cannot be true. Therefore, there's no need for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Why would you encourage someone to go online and listen to the entirety of this debate? There's a lot of nuggets there you're going to work with, hopefully, to motivate you to further study bigger issues. It'll hopefully be a catalyst for researching a thousand other topics. We've been talking with Aaron Shafawalaf, a colleague here at Mormonism Research Ministry, and the debate that he had with Kwaku L on March 6, 2020 at the Utah Valley University. And I would encourage you to look at this debate. And as Aaron has said, I think there's a lot that you will gain from it. You can easily Google it. Just Aaron Kwaku. Kwaku is spelled K-W-A-K-U. His last name is L-E-L. And debate in that Google search. Thanks, Aaron, for sharing that. And uh, I hope that a lot of people will take the time to look at what you had to say during that debate and use some of the information that you brought up in their own individual witnessing scenarios. Hope you have a great weekend.